Kilo Sierra, departing 3 1, South Departure Falcon. What's up, E3 members? This is gonna be exciting. We're gonna jump in the T7 simulator. One of its kind, this is the next generation of pilot training, replacing that T38. It's gonna be exciting. I've never been in there. We're gonna take it for a spin. Shout out to Banyan Flight Shop for making this stuff possible. But with that being said, let's jump in the T7. Here with Steve-O and Stein, who's my former T38 instructor. He's now at Boeing with the T7. He's gonna take us through the T7 simulator. It's gonna be pretty exciting because I flew a lot in the T38. He flew even more in the T38. In fact, as I mentioned a couple of times, I think he was yelling in the back seat of me. We're gonna see just what this T7 can do and how it is advanced and what it's gonna to bring to training, the next level of training for the United States Air Force. This is the T7A Red Hawk made by Boeing out of St. Louis, Missouri. We're gonna run through some of the highlights. The T7s that we have in St. Louis, there are two uh, production representative jets, and then we're just about to have our first flight at the EMD, the Engineering Manufacturing and Development aircraft, within the next month or two. As you'll notice, on the aircraft, we painted, in conjunction with the Air Force, red tails. That's in honor of the Tuskegee Airmen. And one exciting thing that happened today was we had George Hardy, Lieutenant Colonel George Hardy, who's one of the original uh, Tuskegee Airmen from World War II that came and visited. There are also, a, American Airlines uh, is hosting a lot of students that came through and that they're from Chicago, they basically are, in, it's an education program uh, and he basically talked to them and gave them some motivational talks and, and amazing history. So if you don't know who that is, look up George Hardy. His, his uh, career is unbelievable. But we wanted to touch a little bit on what the T-7A is. It's the replacement for the T-38C aircraft, so that the um, objective and the missions of the T-7 will fill all the training requirements of the um, T-38C that's being used. There's five main operating bases. This aircraft will start at Randolph Air Force Base. When we start fueling it, But we'll do a test program and then we'll start uh, fueling it. So if you guys look in the cockpit, you'll see one of the main differences from this and most other aircraft is the large area display down here and then the upfront control display. The large area display is a malleable touchscreen display. So what's on there is not necessarily stuck in, in stone. I can change it around. I can change how many different layouts and portals there are based on what my mission is. So I can show you that. I can actually have you do it or I can do it yeah, reaching awesome. over your shoulder. Um, so this is a two portal layout. If you hit this resize button right there. Resize. There's a opposing Hold arrows. Okay, now that, that basically makes that portal one uh, single layout. Now to change that, if you hit the menu button up here in the upper left. This one here? No, there's a, oh, it looks like a hamburger oh, right menu. Okay, there we go. So now I can change what's on here by hitting this formats menu, and there's three pages of options. So if I want to do navigation, I'm going to pull up navigation stuff. If I want the world's largest ADI, I can push that, and now we got this monster ADI. But if I, if I don't want the large, I can then resize it. I've got smaller. So remember that situation display that you had? Now I can do the map, and now I have a more reasonable size ADI. So the display allows me to change. Um, Customize it right to your preference. That you put. Exactly, exactly. Um, so that being a touchscreen, this is also a touchscreen. So my navigation, my radios, there's some systems over there um, that I can control on the upfront control display. Makes this a very useful, but it's, again, small, compact. And if you look on the sides, there's very few switches, and there's no circuit breakers. So we've removed a lot of those because you just don't need them in a more modern airplane. And I can control them using soft buttons. Nice. Any questions on that? I'm ready to rock and roll. Awesome. So what we'll do for, for this is I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk you through a landing. So we have the upfront control display. This is in not what's in the airplane. In the airplane you have combiners like a, a modern fighter or the T-38C that you're used to. Um, for this is a marketing sim. The, the information up here, you have your airspeed, your altitude, heading, and then I'll talk through some of these other displays as you're flying. Sounds good. All right, your throttle on the left. This is a, this is a T50 throttle, and this in the the push buttons we call them HOTAS. So okay. hands-on throttle and stick. You have those on both the stick and the throttle. On the stick, that's an F22 stick, 
And so this is the exact configuration in the T7. Nice. So we've, they're not exact parts, but they're exact shape and size and functionality. Sounds good. All right. I've got 12 minutes of real time in an F-16. 12 minutes? Oh, you can handle this. So I'll just do a lot of talking, all right? So as you're doing this, so here's your landing gear handle and here's your throttle. If okay. if you start getting saturated, I, then I want you to focus on the stick. Realize the stick doesn't move much. You can practice right now. Yeah, it's left all fly-by-wire, right? By right? It's all fly-by-wire. We have uh, three vehicle management system computers that are continuously trying to figure out what you want, and it makes the flight control services do essentially what you want. It's very forgiving. There's a lot of power. And very maneuverable. So no the, flaps. The flaps are they're flapperons. Okay. When you drop the landing gear, the flaps move down, but then they're still acting as ailerons. Oh, wow. So okay. that's why they call them flapperons. And I guess what's my final approach to be done? You're well. Well, what I'm going to teach you is you're going to fly angle of attack. Okay. I want you to fly an eight degree angle of attack final. In the sim with the fuel that you have right now, it's be at about 160. 160. Right. Okay. Cool. I'll just keep talking as you're flying that way. I can tell you what you need as you get there. Perfect. So we're down simulating, we're at Randolph, and uh, we're 7.7 .7 miles. So if you look at your navigation system, we have the GPS approach set up. It's your uh, primary navigation source is GPS, and the runway we're going to land on is right out there. Got it. So we're going to start by staying, what I want you to do is descend down to uh, 2,100 feet, and we need to slow down. So you can keep the yeah, power in idle, right. and then go out and off freeze, please. And what would it be our landing gear? Uh, speed for 230. So you, you don't want to lower this unless you're below 230. 230. So we'll keep the power back. It, you'll slow down. Uh, it is sensitive. It is. <laughs> it's like yeah, so left, right, super sensitive. And, and um, to, for pitch, if you want to practice, you can pull back and push forward. So it's not as sensitive. Yeah. But most people aren't used to the stick not moving, and most people are used to the stick in the center. With your 10 minutes of experience. That's 12, 12. Oh, 12, 12 minutes of experience, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so go ahead. And this, this is your velocity vector, which is yep. basically saying where you're going. Perfect. So if you want to put the velocity vector on the horizon, you're going to keep your altitude constant right here. And your airspeed's coming back. You're at 240. We're going to drop back down to 230, and then we'll get the gear. But stay level for a second. There you go. I can go gear down. There you go. You can go gear down. Selected. Well, you know, crew coordination is supposed to say gear clear, and he's supposed to clear you. Yeah. We'll write that up in the grade sheet, and we'll we'll yeah. do it. I think I'm easy. I had Stein in the back seat. Gear yeah. is indicating that, that. That's exactly yeah. it. Selected and indicated. Okay, so, so your gear's down, three green, flaps are set, put the velocity vector on the end of the runway. This dash mark shows two and a half degrees, and then this is your AOA staple. As the AOA staple starts moving down, the left wing tip, you want it on the center of the staple. So just kind of let your airspeed drop back again a little bit. You said about 160, right? Right, but again, that's a that's a ballpark, and okay. then what you want to do is use your instrumentation and so center it up. So that's a constructive entity. We have two constructive entities flying around, so don't worry about him. All right, now the velocity vector on the end of the runway, pretty much on the uh, the closest part of the runway, right there is where, where we want to aim. Yeah, it's sensitive. A lot more it sensitive is, than yeah. I thought of it. And in the flare, is, when you start flaring, just be real cognizant of any left right, because you yeah. might get into a PIO. Just kind of let it, if it drifts a little bit close to the ground, not a big deal. So you're on airspeed, on glide slope, everything looks good. Down three green, everything's good there. And now as you get closer to the ground, we'll bring the, the throttle back and then start shifting your aim point. Move it up about to a third of the way. It's real easy on the left, right? Move it back a little bit there, right there. Hold it right there. Then a little bit more. And there you go. Perfect. Not too All right, bad. now throttle back up. Put it in a touch and go. Well, you can go to max AB if you want and <laughs> go ahead and pull the stick back, get the gear up and keep the nose up because you're going to be accelerating like you read about. That's one of the amazing things. There's a lot of power like and it's very slippery. Well, you could. Russ would be really happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So what we can do is uh, here's here's a, maybe a, a, a little bit of a demo on, on the power and the maneuverability. So okay. let, let it slow down. Maybe turn to the right. We'll slow down to 250 knots. Keep the nose down on the horizon, just turn to the right. Okay, right there, now roll out. Now we're gonna do a loop, but we're gonna do a low power loop. Okay. So at 250 knots, go full afterburner, and then pull back on the stick, and we're gonna shoot for four Gs. So right, right there, three, 3.7 is good. Keep pulling, keep pulling, and then roll a little bit. Okay, right there, keep, now, that's good. Oh, yeah. And then 170 knots, now ease off a little bit. Roll a little bit to the right, there you go, now keep pulling. Keep that in full afterburner. Full afterburner. You know the balance. 
and you can look on the tape later, but basically you just did a loop in about 3,000 feet. The T-38s you'd wow. use, you're gonna, you, want, you don't want to start before below 400 or 50 knots, and you're going to use almost 10,000 feet. Wow, that's so awesome. if you if you look at the maneuverability of the T-7, it's very similar to a Block 16 F-15. Sorry, Block 15 F-16, set it backwards. Um, so it's very, very maneuverable, and you can get to a, a very high angle of attack, which means if you're ham-fisting as a student, you get slow, and, and right now in the T-38, if you get slow and you don't do it perfectly, you're, you're probably going to waffle in and, and, and sink. With the power that this has in the AOA, you can actually fly yourself out of it. So it's very forgiving for students, wow, student pretty errors. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's, once you get used to it a little bit, it's a lot easier. But when you first get on the controls, it's, it's sensitive. Right. Mm -hmm. like, really sensitive. And I can feel it. It is. It's funny. So you get an F-15C guy, which I, I've got F-15C time. Well, it takes a little bit longer. An F-16 pilot will say it doesn't move enough. How much and time do you have in the F-15? Uh, about 1,500 hours. 1,500 hours. Wow. And... Uh, the uh, the F-22 guys go, this is perfect because it's an yeah, F-22 yeah, yeah. stick, so oh, yeah. they're already used to it. It's, it's, your, your brain adjusts very, very quickly, surprisingly. Very what else can I show you? Um, I would like, does this have like uh, systems on it to tell you like if a missile's coming at you? Does it does. It, does it? And that like chaff? So, so what, we, what we do, and, and again, we can go into the concept a little bit more detail if you want, but um, when you go through pilot training, you're going to learn all, learn all the stuff now that you do, like formation instruments and all that. And then when you go to introduction to fighter fundamentals, we're going to start by teaching you what a radar is. And okay. then we have the ability to do an old school, what's called a B-scope, or a more high-tech high display, which is called a tactical situation display. So depending on what airplane you're going to, I can pick which one. So it's not just one option, which is kind of really cool. It shows the malleability or the ability to, to change our displays and put what we want. For what If I'm getting targeted, that's going to be on a radar warning receiver yeah. and we, everything we have is unclassified but everything we also have in the models has a slider like I could make the world's best surface air missile or the, the world's worst really? I just set that up in pro in, in my mission planning so we could show that today like yeah. um, no we don't have this set up uh, that okay. way for it but it will be in our um, production software very shortly nice the uh, the missiles are the same way so I can use a medium range missile or short range missile and we're going to teach all the procedures that you need to know when you're flying with that, but they're not real um, performance mm -hmm. capabilities because then it would be classified. Oh, okay, I see. And then air to ground, we do a laser um, guided weapons or GPS guided weapons. And for instance, the laser guided weapons are going to be where you do a targeting pod. Again, this is all simulated, yeah. but we can do everything in the large area display within our software to teach a student how to do it all the steps and the programming that goes into it. Uh, this is quite the tool to be able to get pilots prepared for it is. real life situations. Well, and, and for instance, like uh, Introduction to Fighter Fundamentals right now, it doesn't even fly at night, right? So we're going to be full night vision goggle compatible. Normally, you don't even touch night vision goggles until you go to your operational unit. You don't even know what they are or how they work. You don't know how radar works right now in T-38C Introduction to Fighter Fundamental. So we'll be able to do, introduce that, the simulator, and the aircraft are fully night vision goggle compatible. So as part of the syllabus, in Introduction Fighter Fundamentals, we'll start flying at night. You're going to start pulling up to 8.5 Gs. We don't go supersonic. You have 0.95 Mach. Is the, the ability to replicate a targeting pod like via satellite imagery, is that something that's a capability of doing like an air-to-ground mission if you know it replicates a sniper well, or a pod? Or... I wouldn't say it's satellite imagery. What we have is a visual database. Okay. And within... With what we do is we build this visual database. It's based on imagery and DTED level two, so it's an undulated earth. Now, if you say I've got a either a specific target area or an air to ground range, I will have the models built in there that match the real world in the database. So if I'm in an airplane and I go out to um, the air to ground range at Shepard and I basically paint all the targets that are out there, if I've built the database right, it'll match any, like if you have a row of F4s out there. I can put up fours exactly where they are, and my targeting pod will show you, and then I can look out, and that look, there they are. Now I can drop a weapon on one of them, and within our model, that, air, that airplane will blow up, or the building will blow up. Or if it's, let's say, a, a, I wanted to have a heat, a hot airplane, one hot and the rest cold, I can make it so that those characteristics will show up in the targeting pod, and now I go, oh, I can get into it. One of those was running, or a truck was running, or a hot, or whatever you want. It's, it's almost so complicated. I mean, there's so many preferences and options. Um, it's fantastic, but it's going to be very difficult whoever gets stuck mission planning yeah. building at this scenario. 
um, but we've got a lot of capability, and that's coming straight off the T7A, off the production line that's, that, that, that ATC is getting right now. Yeah, it's a huge advantage. Mean, you talk about cutting, sure. getting more pilots through the pipeline, and if resource for their expand the expense of probably down 35 by 16, but you get some of those base and getting an introduction to MVGs and this mice showing up to your peak works. I think you'll get a more polished student when it, when they get there. It, if you're going to an F-35, we've now taught you how to prioritize all this information. I mean, I've already shown you, I can change this, change that, move this around. And uh, when you first start flying it, if you're on short finally, you go, oh, I should have put this here. You're going to learn, don't do that. Do not change stuff yeah. while I'm in the middle of doing the mission. And you don't learn that until you get to your final unit. We'll be able to teach that. We'll be able to saturate a student, teach them how to deal with the saturation, then work their way through it. And it's all right here. Yeah, that's huge. John, I can't believe you got to do this pretty, with your job. It's like, pretty. It's, it's a pretty okay time. It's yeah, not bad. And they pay you for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <no. laughs> pretty cool. I love it. Talking some so like radar work, for instance. Is that I assume? I mean, I see data link, and we're talking LVC. Uh, how did you kind of walk through? How is that all going to work with the T seven? And like, what would be capable of? Whether you know, it's integrated in IFF or not. Start with embedded training. Within, a, within an aircraft, I have an embedded training software. And when I say aircraft, I'm talking the system. So the simulator and the aircraft have the same software and the same capabilities. Within that is a module we call embedded training. Within the embedded training, I have a radar, I have a targeting pod, I have weapons, air-to-ground weapons, all that. And I have a scenario planner that I'm going to plan what I want for that particular day. I can then have a specific radar. Um, that I've built in, what the capabilities are. I can have entities that are flying out there, like constructive entities, and then I can go out there, I can lock them or they can lock me, and I can shoot them down, they can shoot me down. That's embedded training within one aircraft or within one, within one sim. Now if I take that, and I let's start with simulators. If I have a simulator on the ground and I hook the other simulator on the ground together, now I'm using a data link, embedded training data link. And now I'm getting into the live virtual constructive world. So that information and the scenario that I built and the entities that I built are, the easiest way to describe it is I'm populating a gaming area. So you're in your basement with your T7 sim, you're in your basement, in your mom's basement, you know, Naturally. working that, <laughs> and, and now I'm on the internet, called the, the data link, the internet. I can fight against each other. I can also populate it with surface air missiles and other missiles to, to fight you guys going against the hordes today, right? Try to survive. So how do, how do you shoot a missile at this thing? So you lock on and then the, this, and again, this is out of the F-22. So the, you have a pickle button there and a gun there. Oh, this is the gun, the trigger right here? It is, yeah. So we don't have any rocks. Well, I don't have, I don't have the uh, embedded training <laughs> software running right now. <laughs> that would be fun, though. <laughs> so now go one step farther. If I have aircraft, the aircraft can link to the other aircraft with this data link. And if you're within 100 miles of our antenna farm, they now data link with the simulators. So you're in your basement flying with and or against the F the T7s that are flying out in the airspace. Wow. So I can train very complicated scenarios or simple, depending on what I want to do, or I can put the unexperienced guys in a simulator and the experienced guy, whatever your scenario is, and, and we're going to learn as we're getting this, we feel this, but it's straight off the bat, off the production line in the T7. Does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it's, it's huge. Having the ability to replicate a radar, fight people, yeah, you know, that are not airborne, or that is a embedded part of the embedded training unit. That's it's a huge. Time. And as an instructor, if you go to one of those formats, it's an instructor format. And I don't have it fully populated, but there's a blank line here, so you can go into this scenario control. And you can actually do a repeat mode. As the instructor, you want to watch over his shoulder and make sure he's not screwing something up. So this scenario here, I mean that that uh, scenario control panel. There are eight scenarios per aircraft that I can populate in that. I bring it on the data transfer cartridge, and the data transfer cartridge is programmed just like a tactical aircraft with jumps, which is joint mission planning system. So jumps programs the card, put it in the jet. I have these scenarios, you're gonna have eight. So in your aircraft you have eight. In your mom's basement you got eight. And and so if today you go, we're going to the east airspace, you don't have the scenarios for east you do, you can hit enter, and I load the scenario. It's going to populate based on the area you're training in. And now let's say there's two air-to-air -air entities. You and your aircraft will see them, you'll see them. And you tell him to lock the eastern group, you lock the western group. Oh, and awesome. your, the sims will all compare all that information and then we display it based on what's called a tactical data link. So it looks like that. So that's how that's going to work. That's awesome.
Can you manipulate it as a structure back here, or once it's built in mission planning, that's it? You can manipulate, so let's say there's four entities, you have them uh, in a ladder. They're, they're basically line up, they're, they're straight. And I want to maybe move two over to the east. I can go to what's called a white cell mode. It shows up as little triangles. I drag that white cell, those two entities over. Now I set the picture I want, the student won't see that. Now, but he'll see it on the radar, but you have the white cell mode to manipulate those entities. I can also click on them and change altitude, airspeed, and heading. So all of that can be changed. Now the capability, it might be a MiG-29, you can't change it from being a MiG-29, but you can change some of the other, some of the stuff. If you want to do a different picture presentation. Yeah, different picture. But you have eight, eight options to choose from that you can do different pictures, but then you also have a thing called a pop-up. There's uh, four pop-ups within each scenario that I can set those up to be in relation to you. Let's say all the pop-ups would be uh, 10 miles off your nose, one would be this way, whatever those are. And I can pop, as an instructor, for each scenario I can get those four and I can populate them anytime I want. So you can say, hey, he's doing great, here's a pop-up to do. Here's a, and it's just not expected here, nobody's been talking about them, and it just magically shows up and then you have to deal with them. It's used to be able to get that kind of training, what I'd say is like a low cost, op you know, low cost to operate, to go out there and replicate and get the monkey skills down before you move on to the next next level and you're doing that in something that costs a lot more. Yeah. I, I think the first thing is they're gonna need more time to teach IFF because we have so much more to teach. Yeah, it seems like you could extend IFF, get more bang for your buck, because walking in yeah, to F-16, F-15, F-22, F-35, never having used a screen like this or have it, you know, not knowing how to work a radar, not knowing how to work a target pod. Or a night vision goggles. Night vision goggles. You're going to use all that stuff in a night sortie now, So and you just learn about that they even exist. So your world expands quickly when you start learning about these systems as a, as a pilot. Yeah. And then you have to actually learn to manipulate them while you're flying. You, then you go to night, and it's very disorienting at night. You go to Columbus, and you got weather all the time. Right. There's no weather radar, is there? No. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? But we do have ADSB, so I can actually call up um, yeah. FISB data, so I can get winds at altitudes, I can get a TAF, uh, tactical area forecast, or map. You can call that stuff up using ADSB, but not a moving map radar. Yeah. It's awesome, man. It's kind of makes you spoiled having that amount, amount of information, you know, but it is the modern era. Yeah. And you can set it up for all the failures, too, like system failures and everything. Um, yes. So, did you guys? Did you have something you wanted? You guys want to swap at some point? Sure. Yeah. I, I don't have a lot of fun up here. Okay. <laughs> so, inserting um, faults. So, there's basic simulators now. We we follow all the stuff that's out there now. So, if you fly in a simulator, and we call it a ground-based training system, but the, the simulator itself has an instructor operator station with. Unfortunately, I know this. There's over 208 insertable faults where I can fail your hydraulics. I can make them hot, I can make them low pressure, fail the bump, electrical system problems, all that, but I control that at the instructor operator station. Okay. So that's only ground-based simulators. Now for the weapons, what we're talking about within embedded training in the ILBC, I do have the ability to manipulate weapons. I can reduce the probability of kill for the weapons on the fly um, within the jet. So there's some stuff in the jet, but in the simulator I can do everything. I can do all. Sweet. Does that answer your question? Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, so we can mess with a student pretty bad. Yeah, it's, it's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Really Including great. winds, weather, thunderstorms, Cat 5. We can put in, uh, we have like 10 levels of microbursts, believe it or not. I don't know how that got in the spec, but we're, yeah. we're meeting the spec of the spec. Right. It says that. And so we can really make your day horrible or teach you how to practice it. The lesson is stay away from thunderstorms. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. If there's story. kids watching, just make sure. Don't yeah. find a thunderstorm. Yeah, stay away from thunderstorms. It's bad news. There you go. John, you want to take a shot up here and see how you feel about uh, flying this thing? Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's do it. So we're five miles away from the field to get um, on your HSI, which I got called up. Uh, blue dot, so just like the T38C, we've got different colors. If I change it to TAC and it changes that, and then just do GPS blue, so you can see where the airfield is. You're four miles from it. You can come up initial if you want, or you can just do a straight in. Oh, you gotta come up initial. Whatever you want. You gotta come up initial. All right. Another uh, cliffy fun fact within the T7 simulator, you'll be able to call on the radio, and then we have what's called um, like virtual ATC. Oh, you're on the wrong end. Merged with the T6 guys. <laughs> There's your runway over there. So the uh, the the software will actually respond. So if I'm on the ground, I can call 
for taxi and the software will call back. Um, if you call for approach, for clearance, or for tower, it'll actually talk to you. So if we had it set up for the demo, you could actually call initial and they'd say they'd, they'd respond. Really appropriate radio calls. Gotcha. Are these other airplanes that are flying around simulated or they're actually? They're constructive entities, we call it net force. Oh, okay. So we have software that's running in the background that's flying those airplanes and you can program that. Oh, really? Um, and I can change oh. it around. It's very similar to the scenarios we were talking about for the tactical. Um, they're almost redundant software, but non-tactical, we're using this program called net force. And then for the tactical, it's a different program. So right now, what mode do you have? Then? Like, this is, a, this is they're, they're designed just to keep doing touch and goes. Oh, is that what they're doing? Yeah. Okay. And if we had the radios hooked up, which we don't for this demo, um, you'd hear them called, um, unfortunately they use Navy terms, like they'd say Maverick, you're down, touch and go, one five left. Okay, cool. And then Tower would go, Maverick, you're clear, touch and go, one five left. Nice. And so those entities are actually talking back and forth. The value of that is a student, when you're practicing, especially in the simulator, you're not used to radio chatter. Yeah. So a student will get out there and just talk right, right over somebody else that's talking. So this gives us the ability to just listen on the frequency, wait until it's your turn, then, then talk. Oh, that's great. All right, John, let's see it. Greaser. I haven't even said anything, so he's on his own. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> and dreams. Let's see if all You'll that notice it's pretty, like, just the left right's it. a little bit sensitive, but uh, should be able to touch down about 130. Right on I can't, this thing didn't want to slow down. Huh? No, it's sli slippery. Look at that. Perfect landing. Didn't even have to help. Oh my gosh. Okay, I didn't even know we touched down. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he's holding his wheelie. Dodge the T6 off the nose here. Yeah. Uh, overspeed. So if you're in full afterburner, you need to get your nose up, and you can get your nose up about 30 degrees, and you'll be constant airspeed climb with the fuel weight that we have. So again, it's very a lot of power and very slippery. So if you want to slow down, you can G it up, but if you just go idle and keep it unloaded, you're going to keep going. Like a cornering speed is, what's a, a good cornering speed? I don't think we have a published one, but it's probably what you're kind of familiar with around 380. Still doing all of our flight tests, so a lot of that stuff is still being determined. Some of the wind tunnel model stuff, I'm not sure if we've done that or not. And here's a little uh, fun fact on our HUD that you're probably not used to. So we had that AOA staple that you saw before. Right. But now when you gears up and I'm just flying around and I tell you as a student, I want you to hold 300 knots. What do you do? You look at your RPM, EGT, yeah. and what altitude and this and that. We made it ridiculously easy. So you just have this energy cue. So go ahead and roll out. See this energy cue? I am decelerating until that is off the right wing tip of that. So if I want to hold this airspeed, I move the throttle until the energy cue is off the right wing tip. Now I've got constant airspeed. Oh, wow. It's doing the math for you. It also works when you're maneuvering. So if we do a brake turn, and if I want to do a, what's called a piece of S0, where I'm not losing any energy in a brake turn, I have a certain airspeed. I pull until, um, in most airplanes, you kind of feel a vibration, and we call that a light tickle. Um, this cheats on that, so if you go to full afterburn and you pull, you're going to pull till that energy cue is on your wingtip, and guess what? That's a piece of S0 turn. And one of the things we do when we do a tactical maneuvering, it's called a contract turn. So if I'm at about 350 knots and I'm a flight lead, I'm like, we're both going to do a hook turn, 180. We basically go mill power, you roll, and you, you pull to hold that airspeed and keep a constant altitude. Students have a lot of problem doing that. They'll get fixated looking over here and they lose 50 knots, or they'll unload and they basically get really close to the flight lead. That's going to be a, a crutch, but you basically pull until you have a constant airspeed turn. Now you look at your flight lead, make sure you're not climbing or descending, and, and you're set. What else did you start? 4,000. Right. Now ease off a little at about between 2 and 220, you'll just ease, and then it's now back, now back, keep pulling. So just for that couple seconds, you're going to ease off. If you keep pulling, you'll bleed all your knots, but if you if you ease off and then you'll get it. Would you, yeah, so probably what, about a 3,000 foot yeah. loop? 
versus the ten. That's not bad. Huh? Versus the ten thousand foot loop. Yeah. So what that? Why is that important? So when we're teaching kids how to students how to uh, to dogfight, when you go to a fourth or a fifth gen airplane, you're doing full three dimensional maneuver. If you're in a T thirty eight, if you get your nose more than about thirty or forty five degrees too high or low, you're committed and you pretty much knock it off. If you get your nose low, you're going to go out the bottom of the airspace wow. because it just uses too much and you don't have enough G available. So when we teach students at IFF, you, you teach them within those limits, and I call it two-dimensional maneuvering. And then when you go to your operational unit, the first thing your, your instructor does is a 3D maneuver, and you look at them like, I don't even know what you're doing, <laughs> and it, it blows your mind. Um, so that culture shock is going to be gone, because we're going to be able to teach three-dimensional maneuvering from day one when, we, when we're wow, flying with this. Might have any airliners come off uh, San Antonio here? Not yet. We can put them in there. Though. That's one of the things NetForce allows us to do. I can actually program a bunch of... Airliners, but we have mostly tankers, KC 46s made by Boeing. Strange. Yeah, um, <laughs> but you, you can actually program traffic, and that is one of our requirements is we want traffic in the airspace, we want traffic on approach, we want traffic on center, and the net force entities will be talking. So when a student is climbing out, going out to an airspace, they don't just own the airways, you know, because that's not realistic. So we will input those strategically so that they have to listen. If nobody's talking, then they can talk. If somebody is talking, you wait your turn again, like we said earlier. How do you practice to get efficient, proficient on uh, mid-air refueling? How do, you, how do you train for that, do you know? So we have a tanker out there, and you can practice climbing out, and then you use your radar or air-to-air -air attack hand, and you can rejoin on it, and then you handle the radio comm. So if I'm using it, a lot, right now, no, normally we just have the instructor at the station talking and, and simulating the, the comm. Yeah. If we program it right, then the, the tanker approach control, you can actually check in with the approach. They'll tell you, you can, you're can you clear to the tanker. You call the tanker, the tanker. And this is the net force entity within. It's kind of pre-programmed. I wouldn't call it artificial intelligence, but it, it's talking to you. And it'll tell you you're clear to pre-contact. You fly your airplane there. You get to pre-contact. And then when you refuel, you get to the... When you get close to the entity, the boom actually comes down. Oh, you'll see, so the net force you drops can, the boom. Wow, that's really cool. And then they can rejoin, and all the all the the uh, all the symbology and everything that's on the tanker is in our models. Nice. So yeah, I'd like to thank you for having us and checking out the T7 sim. I think simulator training is very important to be able to prepare you for all the things that you can't do in the real life to, for training. So uh, thanks for having us in here to check it out. Absolutely. Do you have any other questions or it's how do you compare it to T-38s? I mean, it's completely different because you're standing on the side, not in the back right now, yelling at me. Obviously, the avionics, it's its a game changer and what you can do with it. So it's really cool. I, I'm excited to see what this does and how it's going to amplify training. Because just knowing what you can create in this environment, I think will make people more lethal down the road. For sure. Absolutely. We're excited about it, and it should be have our first flight here soon. So watch on the awesome. news channels, and once we get it going, it's going to be it's going to be unstoppable. Yeah. It's going to be an awesome system. Awesome. Thanks, Sid. It's nice to nice to yeah. see you guys. Thank you. Thank you.